All right. Christian. Yes. Christian, uh, where are you from originally? So I am from Birmingham, Alabama. I have uh, pretty much been born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, did a short stint in Tuscaloosa for college, but uh, Alabama born and raised. So if you can't tell from my accent, now you know. <laughs> and uh, tell me about your, uh, just a brief summary of your, uh, your childhood growing up. Yeah, um, childhood was just pretty much um, virtually picture perfect. Um, parents were always there. You know, mom was a school teacher. Dad was in the military reserves and also worked at Alabama Power. Um, so, you know, they, uh, they kept us happy. Had an older sister, of course, and, you know, I just I really had just a picture perfect childhood. That's great. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I can tell it's it's led to a lot of great things down the life as well. So, and what you went to went to high school and college? Yes. Uh, so um, I went to Hoover High School. Um, so anybody out there familiar with uh, there's an MTV show <laughs> called uh, Two a Days. Um, that's where I went to high school. Don't know why I even brought that up, but I did. <laughs> but I uh, graduated from Hoover, uh, then went to the great uh, University of Alabama. Mm. Uh, so. I'll give a roll tide for everybody out there. But what, uh, what have you done for work? Um, so a slew of things, um, a slew of things. Uh, so when I got out of college, I was uh, starting in sports event management. Um, so we would do a lot of events setting up for Alabama football games. Um, we also uh, focused uh, on a track that was local to Birmingham. They have an indie race out there about one, yeah, it's once a year. Um, so we would set up for that and some other events out there, and I absolutely I, I loved it. It was really the dream job for out of college. But of course, once everything happened, I needed to make a little bit of a career shift. So went into banking. Um, that was an experience, uh, retail banking, um, very fun. Uh, then I went into corporate sales, account management, uh, with background screening and drug testing, uh, and now I am currently a technically a design consultant for a company at Rebath, basically going in, helping folks uh, redesign a bathroom um, and try and sell it. Excellent. And uh, you had an accident a while yes. back. Yes. Tell me about that. Yeah. So uh, tr February 27th, uh, 2016, um, it was a Saturday, a very interesting day. Uh, we had a meeting with my father earlier that day. Um, after the meeting, we went and had lunch, um, and then he actually went and bought a new-to-him car. Um, he was looking for a new car, so went out and test rode that with him, and he ended up making the purchase. Um, so I was driving his old car back, um, back home, and um, for whatever reason, we are never got of a, really a definitive answer, if you will, but uh, there was a fire that started in the passenger floorboard. Um, I was driving down I-65 south. Uh, anybody in the Birmingham area will know where that is. Um, and I had a fire that started in the passenger floorboard. So here I am, you know, going 70 miles down the interstate, and I look over and kind of look back up the road, and I do the double take. I'm like, wait, wait what is this? What is going on here? And um, it was really interesting. About that same time, the interstate starts to curve into a left curve. Um, and when they looked at my tire tracks, I continued going straight instead of going into the left curve. Um, so I ended up running off the road. Now, it was really interesting because when the car came to a stop, I knew it was on fire. I, you know, total instinct, you know, fight or flight kicked right in. I knew, hey, I've got to get out of this car immediately. Now, what I didn't realize was that when I ran off the road, <laughs> I went into a ravine um, and kind of flipped the car on its side. So when I tried to get out of the car, I pulled the door handle, tried to push open the driver's side door, nothing budged. I figured maybe the lock was still on, something happened. Fidgeted with the lock, tried again, nothing happened. Now, at this point, um, uh, a 24-year-old young male, uh, nothing bad has happened to me up to this point in life, really. Um, you know, I was in the gym every day working out, so 
I thought, well, surely I can break out this driver's side window. Um, so I had a little jacket on and started punching it, elbowing it, and it just, it didn't budge. For whatever reason, I just could not break this window. And at that point I had that, you know, there's all these infomercials for these things that cut your seatbelt and break out the glass. And like, I was sitting there, I was like, dang, man, I wish I had one of those right now. Um, I, wish I, I wish I didn't pass those infomercials up, but uh, I did. Um, and of course, I think the rear uh, airbags had gone off, so there was no climbing back the, uh, through the back, if you will. And of course, the fire was just being fueled in the passenger side. So. I'm kind of sitting like fire this. Was, the fire was large. It was a big fire. Yes, um, and the the other theory um, that we had about the fire was when the car came to an angle that the fuel line was actually siphoning gas from the fuel tank up to the fire. Um, so it just continued to grow and grow. However, I didn't really realize the extent of the fire. Uh, my adrenaline was going 110 miles an hour. I didn't feel a thing. I had the most intense tunnel vision I've ever had in my life. Um, but, you know, once I, I couldn't get that door open or break the window, I really just thought, you know, I had that moment where I just said, this is how I go. You know, this is, this is the way I go. And you know, it's a little cliche because you hear people say this and talk about things um, that happen in near-death experiences. And I had all these memories that kind of flashed before my eyes. You know, all these great memories I had, you know, with my dad, with my mom, with my sister. Um, and it was, it was kind of interesting because it was a flash of just almost picture-like. Um, and then I had this just moment of clarity where I was like, you know, I can't, I can't go like this. This is going to be, <laughs> it's going to be way too painful to die like this. You know, you always hear burn alive. That's got to be extremely painful. So I slid down in the driver's side seat, um, and I began to kick the windshield. Now at this point I was, I probably had about pinpoint vision just because the tunnel vision was so intense. Um, about the fourth kick of the windshield, however, I got it to crack. Um, it's pretty amazing um, that I actually got it to crack. And then on the fifth kick, um, I actually had uh, a hole in the wind windshield. Now, of course, this all felt like 60 minutes had passed by, but it was probably more like five minutes maximum. Um, but by the time I got that hole in the windshield, uh, two bystanders, uh, Edric Williams and John DeBlue, uh, two friends of mine now to this day, uh, ran down and they grabbed a big old stick and they were like, hey, we're going to get you out of here. You just got to help us push. And to me, you know, I felt no pain. I had no idea what was going on. So I was like, yeah, no problem. Let's get out of here. <laughs> like, no problem. Um, so they got a big old stick in that hole and pulled the rest of the windshield out. And when they did that, you know, I stuck my arms out and they were like, all right, push off the console. And they grabbed me by my wrist and I, of course, pushed off the console and they got me out of the car. Now, there's a lady at the top of the hill, right? She's screaming, the car is going to explode. Da, da, da. You see all the Hollywood movies. Typically, cars don't explode. I'll go ahead and say that. Um, however, at that time, I didn't really know. So I was very concerned about the car exploding. Um, but they got me out uh, and they carried me for probably a couple of feet before they set me down. Uh, and when they set me down, I was like, guys, what, do, you know, what are we doing here? We got to get out of here. This is, this is serious. Um, but what I didn't realize was that I was completely engulfed in flames at that point. Um, so when they actually had grabbed my wrist, everything just melted away. So when they set me down, it was because they were getting burned on their hands and because there was just nothing to grab onto. Now, luckily, as I mentioned earlier, I was in a meeting with my dad earlier that day and I had some leather shoes on and a leather belt. Um, so they grabbed me by my leather belt and by my leather shoes and they carried me to the top of the hill. Now, again, I'm still, still in this pinpoint vision. I don't have real full vision, you know, full, um, peripheral at that point, uh, but they get me to the top of the hill. Of course, I'm being carried, you know, face down, and I really open my eyes and I look 
at my legs to try and just get a gauge of how bad things really are. And I looked at my legs and I had some, some denim type pants on uh, that day, but the pants and my skin, it was just dripping away like candle wax. Um, you know, the, the thing I thought in that moment was, wow, this is, this is like a Hollywood movie. Like, because this is what you see in, you know, Batman and, and all this stuff, and you see all these major burns, and, you know, I was looking at it on my own body. Um, so that was a, a little bit of a, a wake-up call. But they set me down right after. Um, it's very interesting. It was, it was really like a short, uh, a, a wave of pain that really started at the very top of my head uh, and then just went through my body, and that was the last thing I remembered. Um, so I went in the shock at that point. Now this is, again, on I-65, a major interstate, uh, going through Birmingham. So we've got traffic stop, we've got ambulances, fire trucks everywhere. Um, and they got me into the ambulance, of course, uh, and took me to uh, the only level one trauma hospital in, in the uh, county of Jefferson, or really in the state of Alabama, I think. Um, and what's interesting was the whole time I was telling the EMT my dad's name, his cell phone number, you know, who to contact, all these things. Zero recollection of that. So they uh, got me to this hospital, um, and you know the prognosis was was not great. Um, at that time, they were looking, they were thinking that I had a. 90, 95 percent burns to, or third degree burns to 90 to 95 percent of my body at that point. Um, and the way they do the consultations um, for a burn that large is they pull the family in that evening, um, say you're 90 percent burn, they're going to say, well, you got about a five to 10 percent chance to live. Um, so my brother in law, my now brother in law, um, who was engaged to my sister at the time, uh, he was working in government, so he had the wherewithal to record the conversation. Um, so I got to listen to the family consult the, that Saturday night. Uh, and the doctor said, you know, got a 5 to 10% chance to make it through uh, that night. He said, if I did make it through the night, I would never walk out of the hospital. Uh, and I, I would likely be on dialysis for the rest of my life. I can go for a jog today and never been on dialysis. So and we'll talk about how we got there too as well. Um, so obviously, you know, as a, as a parent, that's not encouraging to hear. Um, you know, if, as a family member, that's just not what you wanna hear. Um, so, you know, I think this Saturday night, all of my friends kind of started to <laughs> flood UAB. I, I think they might have overwhelmed the hospital a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, Sunday came, and I was still fine. Um, UAB, I'll say the hospital name now, they weren't planning on doing surgery uh, until Wednesday. Um, and if you know anything about burn care, you know, skin, the skin is your lar largest organ on your body. Um, so once you lose really, I always say over 40 to 50%, um, you really need to get into a specialized burn center um, and you need to get covered with either a cadaver skin or something to protect you um, because I think it makes up about 80% of your body and that's just basically a, a petri dish, if you will, for infections and uh, fungal infections and just viruses. So um, it's really important to start a debridement process very quickly or as soon as possible. Um, and like I said, you know, we weren't starting this process till really four days after. So really crazy thing, my mother calls them God winks. Um, just a couple of interventions that happened along, um, along my journey that kind of put me to where I am today. Um, on Sunday, my sister's now father-in-law, David Helton, came up to my dad and pulled him aside and said, you know, I know this, um, this great burn attorney in the state of Georgia, uh, and he knows this doctor who's supposedly world-renowned in burns, and I got a cell phone number. You want to give him a call? And, you know, parents sitting there looking at 5 to 10% chances is like, yeah, we'll try anything. Um, so my dad calls this world-renowned burn doctor on Sunday night on his cell phone. He picks up. My dad tells him everything that's going on. He says, 
have his doctor call me Monday when she comes in for rounds. So Monday morning she comes in, my dad says, hey, I've got this doctor I want, kind of want you to talk to. So they talk, go back and forth. She fills them in on my case, uh, what's you know going on with everything. Um, and they agreed to admit me. And so the doctor gets off the phone and comes to my dad and says, you know, they agreed to admit you or admit your son. You know, what do you want to do? And my dad says, well, if this was your son, what would you do? And she said, I'd transport him. Um, so about an hour and a half after that transpired, um, the MedJet team came in, got me all wrapped up. Um, stabilized and probably I would say another 30 minutes after that I was on a med jet over to Augusta Georgia uh, to JMS burn center in doctor's hospital JMS is now changed to BRCA I like to make that designation but um, it took about 45 minutes to get to Augusta and about another 20 minutes after that I was in the operating room to start my first surgery now um, my sister's husband, you know, his family's friend had friends who had a plane that came and picked up my family and took them over to Augusta. And so they were about 45 minutes behind me. And when my dad got off the plane, he was given surgical consent uh, to the doctor that we haven't even really met yet uh, to begin surgery. Um, so that, uh, that Monday night, I uh, started or had my first, it was a seven and a half hour surgery. Um, a debridement of, I think it was the backside, they started first. And everything went well, everything went great. Uh, so, you know, after the surgery, uh, he pulls my dad aside and says, you know, he did great. You know, what we're gonna do is, in the morning, we're gonna flip him over and do the other side. So, next morning, went back into surgery, did another eight hour surgery uh, for full debridement. And, you know, the rest, that kind of really just started my journey at uh, what is now BRCA or Doctors Hospital in, in Augusta, Georgia. So I, I consider it a medically induced coma. Um, they use a cocktail of drugs, of course, to create amnesia because those first stages of burn care, you don't want to remember those. Um, it is, burn care is, it, it takes a special person with a special heart um, that has a higher calling. Uh, I'll just, I can just leave it at that. It's, um, it's pretty remarkable. So I was in a, a medically induced coma for about a month and a half, kind of two, I started coming out, but I was still in and out for about two months. Um, it's, it's really funny. <laughs> the first thing I, I really, really remember um, outside of the, in crazy, almost psychedelic dreams that I was having or hallucina hallucinations, I'm not sure exactly what it was, um, was one of my physician assistants um, coming up to, to me and, and telling me that, hey, um, <laughs> this was the fir first thing I heard, it was so strange to me. She was like, don't worry, you're still gonna be able to have kids, you're, you're fine. You're fine. And maybe they had told me stuff before this and I was just, this was the first thing that really connected. Um, but to me, when they, when you've got a large burn, they use, um, I'll try not to get uh, into too many details, but they use a thing called a BMS. Um, and what that stands for is a bowel management system. Um, and what it is, is basically a tube. They put up the rectum. That way you can pass um, without getting it into the burns and causing infection. So I woke up with one of those. Um, and because of the wild dreams I was having, I thought I had sat on a Coke can. And so my, my physician assistant, she's sitting here telling me, oh, well, you're going to be able to have kids again one day. And I'm sitting here telling her, trying to tell her that, I sat on a Coke can, I need you to get this out of me because it's uncomfortable and I can't like rest with this. Um, of course, we had to live with that for a few more weeks, but that was really my first interaction. Now, of course, I also had a trach tracheotomy, um, which is basically where they make a hole in your neck, uh, hook you up to a ventilator um, and use the ventilator to assist with breathing. That way you can kind of get your lungs back under you 
um, because I did have, a, I had a little bit of smoke, bit, smoke damage, uh, but not too much. Um, of course, they can also go in and basically scrub that out of your lungs now, which is pretty remarkable. Um, but really the, the main process for everything kind of started really before I woke up and then once I woke up was, was when the, the work began. Um, the first major, major surgery um, I had was for a process called CEAs. Um, it's culture, epithet, autograph, I'm butchering that name. Um, but what it is, um, when you have a large burn, well, let me back up. When you have a smaller burn, you know, if you've got a 30% burn, you've got a lot of surface area to take skin grafts from. Now, when you get into those higher numbers, you know, there's not so much good skin to take grafts from and cover the rest of the body. Um, so what they actually do, I, this is pretty much the cutting edge of, of burn care right now. Um, of course, it's changing every day, but uh, they took a posted size piece of skin. Uh, I've got a good piece of skin here on my arm. Um, and they send it off to a uh, lab in Boston. And what this lab does is take that piece of skin, puts it in an incubator, and they grow sheets and sheets and sheets of skin. Now, if you know anything about skin, there's, one, there's two layers. There's the epidermis and the dermis. Now, when they grow it, I think it's only the epidermis layer, the outer layer. Um, but that is what they use for what I call the CEA surgery. Now, the CEA surgery is a three-step process. Um, and it is a mental test. Um, it was probably one of the most challenging things I had to do. So uh, the first step is they take you back for a debridement. Um, so the first thing they do when you get you in there, they take you back again to make sure that the surface where they're putting the CAs is completely um, clean and you know, you're not worrying about infection or anything like that. Um, and they do that step they'll get a notification from the lab uh, that they're sending in the skin about a day or two before it's actually getting there. So they'll go ahead, schedule that surgery, wait for the skin to arrive. And then when the skin does arrive, that's when you've got the major surgery. Um, so the way the CEA process works, and it's all dependent on how much you're trying to cover, um, but the CEA pieces, they come in one by one squares. Now, the first one I had was on my legs, and that's a lot of surface area to cover. Um, so what they do is actually they run it through a machine and it stretches it out. So it takes that one by one and maybe turns it into like a four by four or three by three. That way you can actually cover more skin or more surface, but it also makes a thinner skin as well. So the way they do that, you go back into that second pro or second step surgery. Um, and these pieces of skin have little backing, little plastic backing on them, and they just staple them onto the body one by one. Now, once that procedure's over, you've got to be completely still for seven to 10 days. Um, you don't want to move at all um, because you don't want the thin skin to shear. You want that skin to actually take hold into the body. Um, so you've got to virtually remain motionless for about seven to 10 days. Um, now, of course, my first one, uh, that was difficult because I was not really in a state of consciousness to be able to accept and say, hey, yeah, I need to be still. So um, it was really interesting. The doctor came in and was like, we're gonna have to give you a paralytic if you don't be still because I was flashing, thrashing around, throwing my legs everywhere. And for anyone that doesn't know what a paralytic is, basically it is an IV injection. Uh, and when you have a paralytic, really the only thing that you can move are your eyeballs. Um, so that makes a person completely immobile except for their eyeballs. And I was completely unconscious, but when he said that, I quit thrashing around. I quit worrying about, I, uh, I some, for whatever reason, I, I behaved. I had my arms and my legs strapped to the bed, but. Uh, I calmed down after I heard all of that. Um, but that was really the, the, the main step. And then of course, after that seven to 10 day period, they take you back for another procedure um, and they remove that actual plastic backing from the skin. Um, so it's a really a three-step process. Um, are, are you still going through surgeries now or are you done, um, done I haven't that? really had any surgeries lately. Um, you know, I've gotten to the point where it's just really easier 
in most, <laughs> most circumstances, easier to adapt than try to change things, learn something new, and then adapt that way too. I've pretty much got everything figured out. I can you know, work out with dumbbells and do all that great stuff. Are, are, um, you, are there limitations in life now? Um, a little bit here and there. Of course, you know, my hand um, is probably, I guess, one of the biggest limitations. You know, you lose mobility in the hand. Um, but what I will say about the hand is that this was initially intended to be completely removed um, when I was at the first hospital. However, when I got to JMS, now B BRCA, the doctor said, Dr. Fred Mullins, um, let me, may he rest in peace, um, said, we're just gonna wrap this hand, we're gonna leave it alone, we're gonna let it heal, and at the end, we're gonna work on it. And did just that, and it was a very painful healing process um, at the end because you, become very sensitive when you're not touching your hands and you've got a burn on there. Everything becomes extremely sensitive. Um, so I would have to just wrap my hand in just a standard wrap and it would take an hour and a half just because of the pain. Um, it was just, it was kind of un unreal. Of course, I had some great physical therapists, um, Brett and Logan, uh, they were fantastic. They just, uh, they wanted to work with me um, and I wanted to work with them and that kind of made all the difference in my recovery um, being able to get mobility back and you know when I was finally conscious of everything it was really about three months after everything had happened that I, I learned the extent of everything I was going back for another CAA's CEA surgery um, and the anesthesiologist, who I had not had before, um, once you're in the hospital for some time, you tend to get and meet the people that are caring for you very well. Um, I had not had him before, and I, I told him, I was like, man, I'm extremely nervous about this surgery. And he was like, what are you, what are you talking about? I was like, I'm just really nervous to have surgery. And he was like, you've had 20 surgeries already. What do you, what do you mean? And I was I like, he's wheeling me to the OR and I look at him like, 20 surgeries, what happened? He was like, no, you, you had 80% third degree burns. And that's when it clicked and I was like, oh, so this was a lot bigger than I thought it was. Because you were kind of out of it for most of this? Right. Yeah. And when I woke up, I didn't have any broken bones, no brain trauma, I, no trauma at all other than the burns. So I woke up a, a 24 year old just ready to go home, you know? Um, and really, I guess when I woke up was around the masters, some, so sometime around April, uh, my birthday is April 24th. Um, so my goal was to get out by April 24th, you know, make the, uh, make the moves that I needed to do and, and get out by April 24th. and. Um, you know, all my PAs and nurses were like, okay, we'll, we'll shoot for that. Um, but of course, I didn't end up leaving until uh, August 1st. So I was in there for about five months in a day. So, How, how, how have you handled this emotionally when, when you were finally? Yeah. Um, you know, it's obviously it, it's, it's a challenging thing to accept at first. Um, you know, you, you go through 24 years of looking at the same thing in the mirror every day and then everything changes. Your mobility changes, um, you, you know, you're completely looking at yourself and you're just like, I don't even recognize myself. Um, so that, you know, that, that does pose a challenge, um, but the way I tried to approach it, I try to be a little bit more analytical in things in, in the way I approach things. Um, I had, a, of course, my family virtually moved over to Augusta, so my parents, they were there every, I had four visiting sessions a day, totaling two hours, so they could visit me four times a day. Didn't miss a single one. Um, I had just an outpouring of support. I think like, I was getting cut postcards from like 11 different countries, and I had people make me posters and collages, and they were direct, decorated in my hospital room, so it wasn't like this sterile environment. I had all these things from friends and family. Um, so that really kind of helped boost my mood, but I also had a, just an unbelievable care team. Um, I, I really can't say, I can't say enough about my care team. 
Um, but there's one person in particular, of course, my physical therapist were really in the trenches with me every day and, and doing the hard work, which was, you know, making a person move that doesn't want to move. Um, but, you know, uh, Kim Linkcomb was one of, she kind of bounced around as a nurse, but I don't know what it was. I guess it was she had boys that were similar in my age, so she kind of took this motherly role towards me, if you will. Um, and, you know, she would come in there and, and we would chat and she was just, everybody knew, you know, they've been in burn care for so long, they know how to direct the emotional part of things. So, you know, for me, it became, you know, it wasn't a why, why me? Why me, Mark? It became a why me? You know, why did this happen to me? What's, what's my purpose now? Was, um, let me ask you a question. Was, sure. it, is, was your general view of it you, that you were very unlucky or very lucky? Um, the general view was that I was lucky um, because, you know, like you, I was, could, you could have taken either, you know, either side. Right, right. And, you know, of course, I think that's very common in the hospital. Um, you know, my, we would always, my dad would always joke with, with our physical therapist that, they would say it was so easy to work with me. Like it was, they enjoyed working with me because I would work with them. And, you know, my dad always said, you know, a lot of times, especially, you know, older folks, they run into situations, they get in the hospital and they just want somebody to rub their feet and help them go to the bathroom. Um, and I, I get it, I get it 100%. I'm 100% empathetic to that because you know, like we see on your channel, not everybody has this per picture perfect upbringing that is going to help them through these trials that, you know, life throws at us. Um, but for me, it was uh, this, this, I always think this, and it sounds so cliche or, or corny, if you will, but I almost had this lion mentality. Um, you know, I wanted, I wanted to get out of that hospital. I wanted to go home. I just wanted to go home. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to go home. And I knew the only way I was going to get to go home is if I worked. So I just had to do the line mentality. Uh, when the physical therapist came, didn't matter how I was feeling. Um, they were going to come and nag you until they got you up. And I thank them for that now. And the reason I say this is because for the next young adult that's sitting in the bed uh, in the ICU thinking, hey, my life's over, um, this is going to change everything for the rest of my life, you know, life's not really going to go on how I wanted it to. Well, um, just to let you know, it, if you listen to what the doctors say, you do the work, you put the work in, um, you can get back to living a productive and happy life. So, and of course, you know, I say that this all happened in 2016, so we're, we've got some time to look back on it. And of course, there was, I won't lie, there's days where I didn't want to get out of the bed or the physical therapist had come in and they're like, all right, well, we'll come back and check on you an hour. And I would be watching that clock so closely. Um, but when they came, it was, it was time to work. But I had a lot of work to do. Um, of course, when you're, if you think about it, you know, think about taking a multi-hour plane line plane ride, if you don't get up from your seat, you're feeling kind of, you're like, I feel stiff. Like I need to move around or stretch or something. Now try sitting there immobile for about two months. <laughs> you lose everything. Um, so uh, it, was, it was kind of remarkable. I, I, this was something that caught me completely off guard that I didn't expect. And of course, what I tell everybody is burns or something you don't have to know about until you have to know about them. But I needed assistance just to roll over on my side. I couldn't sit up. I couldn't roll over. I had to have two people or one person on each side uh, to assist me with walking. I had to relearn how to eat. Um, I had to relearn how to do everything. And that was a challenge um, because, like I said, you know, I, was, I went from 24-year-old spring chicken to I can't even get out of bed on my own. Um, Did you have moments where you were – De, you know, down and depressed about it? It's, you know, there was, there were certainly times where I felt discouraged um, because when you're in there, time slows down um, because you're just, 
pretty much trapped in these walls. You're seeing the same people, you get visits from your family, but other than that, it's really you in this isolated room until your nurse comes in or the doctor comes in, but it leaves you there a lot of, uh, it leaves you with a lot of time to think um, about things. And that's, you know, one of the other things I wanted to mention is, you know, for that time in my life, I thought, you know, everything, like I said, it was, you know, just about picture perfect up to that point. Um, and really, though, I think what a lot of young adults don't get to do in this age of social media and go, 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 is no one stops and takes account of how they're doing. No one checks in on themselves. No one says, well, do I need to course correct here or do I need to keep going? Um, how I'm going. And I think that really gave me the time to stop and really reflect. I won't say, um, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't like a bad guy per se, but I was very self-absorbed. Um, you know, I kind of had really left relationships on the table um, with other women uh, in college. You know, just, I was just so self-absorbed. Um, and when you're in the hospital, you know, especially in the ICU for four and a half months, there's action going on all the time. There's noises, it's hard to sleep. Um, so I had a lot of time to, to take notes on myself and really course correct. And I, I mentioned this before we started, and, and I know you've said this in several interviews, but you know, for you, the channel is a crash course in empathy. Um, and for me, this trial, if you will, was really a crash course in empathy as well. Um, because once I was in the ICU and spending time there, there was other patients that I was hearing about and connecting with their families. You know, when you've got one family sitting in a waiting room for four hours and your family sitting in the day after day, um, eventually Southern hospitality is going to kick in and somebody's going <laughs> to say, hey, how you doing? You know, do I need to check on your loved one or do anything? So we had a system like that. Um, has, that we had. Has that been the biggest change that you've seen is, is just your gratitude? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's why I'm drawn to the channel so much is because it gives me a chance to see these people that, you know, all walks of life, of course, but, you know, a lot of folks that we may say, hey, you know, these people are different from me, so I don't really want to, you know, they can do their thing or whatever, the, but stay over here. But now I, I look at it at a, a, or through a lens rather that, you know, Everybody in life goes through something. There's no, there's no escaping life without a trial, without a tribulation. Um, and what I, always, what I learned when I went in to do peer support training for burn survivors is that it doesn't matter how big the burn is, it's going to likely be the most traumatic experience of their lives. So if you're thinking about it, you know, everyone – this was what would always happen to me in the hospital. Everybody would say, oh, 80%, that's so terrible. You know, I, I was only burned, you know, 40% or, or 30%. And I'm, I'm like, but that was, that's obviously the worst thing that's ever happened to you, right? That's the most painful thing you've ever been through, you know? And they're like, well, yeah, it, it really was. And I was like, so your burn is right here next to mine because it doesn't matter what you've been through, the worst thing that you've ever been through is the worst thing you've ever been through. So there's no, there's really no comparison um, as far as burns or really anything else in life. Um, it just, it is what it is. The worst thing you've been through is the worst thing that you've been through. And really up until that point, you don't know anything else. It's kind of, if you think of like a baby, you know, a baby laughs or they cry. And that's just because they don't know how to express any of other emotions. And it's kind of this, I kind of liken it to the same thing that, you know, you just don't know until you know what the next worst thing is. Um, so, you know, it, it was very interesting, the, the mental part, you know, again, I had psychiatrists, counselors, I mean, they would come to my room, we would talk about things, um, they would assist me with anything that I needed help with, but you know, I had such a strong support system, so many people riding me. I mean, I would 
I would get 14, 15 letters a day. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was just, I never got that much mail in my life. It was crazy. Um, but I had so much support. Um, and I think my family, my, specifically my mom and dad, being able to move over there, and then, of course, my sister coming in just about whenever. And now my brother-in-law's brother and sister, they were also living in Augusta, so they would come and check on me. So I, I saw, I saw, firsthand what that does um, for patient care. Um, there was another patient, I won't get into specifics, I don't want to get anybody into trouble, um, but there was another patient there, uh, a little bit younger than me, had been there for over a year, um, and what I was told was, you know, he had some troubles uh, leading up to it, um, and essentially had to try to self-immolate with gasoline. Um, so he was in the burn center and apparently his mom showed up one day and she walked in the room and said something to the effect of, you really effed up now, um, and then turned around and walked out and the staff never saw her again. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, he just, surgeries wouldn't take, just couldn't heal, just no matter whatever they threw at him, it just didn't work. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, family and support systems are, you know, 80, 90, 100% of the care, but, um, you know, it, it really, it really makes a difference. Um, and of course, you know, the other thing also is nutrition is, is a big thing for burns, um, which is difficult because, well, I had a feeding tube, of course, but it was feeding tube whatever my parents could bring me, the hospital meals, they wanted me to eat everything. Um, I was burning, I was burning about 4,000 calories a day, just, just laying there, just, just not even doing anything because my body was healing. Um, so it needed the energy and, you know, I've, uh, I'll be honest, I've, at the beginning, I've, I gave some pushback to it because when you don't eat anything for two months, your stomach shrinks. So, you know, they're like, eat whatever you want, which sounds like a dream to most people, but your stomach's sh really shrunk um, and you're like on these, all, all these medications and everything that you just, you just kind of feel out of it and not ready to eat. But nutrition was another big piece of it. And of course, um, towards the end there, um, I was taking down like, I want to say like 2,000, 2,500 calories just in nutrition shakes uh, a day. Um, so. But uh, you know the whole the whole experience was was really interesting and you know overall once I started to get better really towards month three um, I actually started healing a lot faster than they anticipate um, so I was going back in for debridements on my right arm almost every other day um, because when when you have a large burn the the skin normally heals slowly. So it kind of comes back together real smoothly. But if, I don't want to give myself too much credit, but if you're following nutrition and healing quickly, then the skin will go quickly and then it will start to raise and you get all these bumps. So they would take me back to debris those bumps every other day or so. But um, that just showed the, the sign of you know, how well I was, I was healing. Um, and about that time, uh, I would say, you know, my parents started feeling a little comfortable, you know, going back home and taking care of things <laughs> over there. Um, and I felt more comfortable because all the nursing, excuse me, all the nursing staff knew me, um, you know, as, as I basically felt like a celebrity in the hospital as well. Um, because when you're there so long with a large burn, you know, everybody learns about you because it's an interesting story, to say the least. Um, so. You know, it, 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 was a, it was a really interesting transitioning from the burn ICU up into inpatient rehab for mobility. Um, now, of course, in the ICU, I was virtually on, well, not virtually, I was on 24-7 around the clock pain medication and antifungals, antivirals, all this kind of stuff. And when I went to inpatient rehab, it was not all that. Um, you know, didn't have all these leads and feeding tubes and IVs and everything. So it, 
it gave me a chance to be like, wow, I didn't realize how poorly I was resting <laughs> in the, the ICU until I got up here to where it was quiet. They turned the lights out at night and everything. But even though I spent really two weeks in inpatient rehab, that was, that was just like a whole other fold of, of, of an empathy lesson for me because it wasn't just burn survivors. Um, sure, there were a couple burn survivors up there, um, and uh, there was actually a Spanish-speaking family up there that I kind of got to know because my dad spoke Spanish, and the family was having trouble uh, communicating with the staff. Um, so my dad would go help and translate, um, and of course we got to know him from that. Again, a another crazy story, but. I saw the way you know his recovery went, and just I mean, it kind of made me self-reflect and say, "Wow, you know, this is I got the best of the best." Um, and you know, I didn't mention this earlier, but when my dad initially called the doctor while I was still in Birmingham, the doctor said, "Look, we're gonna we're gonna throw everything that we got at him. Just know that right up front." And they did. And fortunately, <laughs> it doesn't always work out like this, but fortunately for me, um, you know, a lot of it took and a lot of it worked. Um, so. You think your positive attitude somehow helped with your recovery? Absolutely. Um, and I've, I kind of sounded like, well, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it definitely plays into it. Um, because. How, how, was your, how was your life today? Life today is great. Life today, today is, is great, you know. Um, I get to go out in my job, meet people, help them. That's really my number one thing is trying to help people and just kind of learn about people. I'm, <laughs> I've got a girlfriend now and she <laughs> mentioned the other day, she's like, sometimes you're kind of like a, you kind of come off as a know-it-all. And I was like, I know I come off as a know-it-all sometimes, but it's not that. I just want to understand how people tick. I want to understand every facet of everything that I can possibly understand. That just, that intrigues me. Um, so it's not so much of a, I don't know everything, but I want to agree in a conversation that I might not know about. That way we can continue the conversation, I can learn. Um, so now today for me, you know, I've got my bad moments, just like everybody else. Um, you know, there's days that I wake up and I'm like, oh, I don't want to get up today. But for the most part, you know, <laughs> it's hard to not stay positive um, with the way things are for me now. Um, I could have a completely different circumstance um, as far as patient outcome than I did. Um, and of course, dating is difficult. I mean, I think it's difficult for everybody because a lot of dating has really boiled down to, do I like this picture or not, left or right? Um, and that's, you know, obviously difficult with a, a person with a lot of scars. Um, and, you know, really all it took was just one person that I was interested in, that was interested in me, um, being willing to let me show them how much I would care for them. Um, you have a beautiful girlfriend out there. Oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. She is, she is. Um, she always, she always makes jokes. <laughs> like that guy was, we we'll walk down the street, and I was like, guy, that guy was like looking at you. I don't know why. I was like, she's probably wondering how in the heck I landed such a beautiful girlfriend. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, she, she, she has a burn on her arm, right? Yes, yes, yes. Different accident, um, but. Uh, similar, similar, a little bit of a similar story. I assume you guys met in some of the... Yes, so uh, we, we talked about that, but uh, I had a friend, um, uh, Sandy Nairmore, um, who runs uh, a nonprofit, Magic Moments in Birmingham, which is kind of, it's basically Make-A-Wish, or similar to Make-A-Wish, but for Birmingham area residents. Um, and she knew her and was like, hey, I think you guys would, would be great, you know, to, to meet and, and talk about what you guys go through. So we met uh, for dinner in 2017 or 18. <laughs> I felt like it was a date. Um, she kind of was just like, hey, we're just meeting. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, she ended up moving to Huntsville um, for a couple of years and then uh, she moved back uh, in January 2023, so she sent me an Instagram DM. I was like, hey, I'm moving back. We should get dinner. And uh, 
we went and had dinner and the rest is history. Now she's out in Santa Monica with me. So. There you go. <laughs> what, what, do you, uh, what would you say is the most important thing you've learned from all this, Christian? Mm, man, there's so many things. Um, probably the most important thing, probably the most important thing is empathy. Um, and I know we've, I've kind of expanded on that a little bit, but, you know, a lot of times, you know, life now is, for a lot of folks, very go, go, go. Um, we're getting social media here, other media here. Just, we got all this stuff in our face. Um, so, you know, we're driving down the road and there's someone in front of us that's going slow, right? And, you know, speed up, I got, I'm in a hurry, go, 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 go. And I fall into those moments, I won't lie. Um, but I think the most important thing is to have empathy for other people. Um, and what I try to do now is <laughs> if I get behind a, a slow car, I'm like, all right, this is, they just baked a fresh apple pie. They got it in the front seat and they want to be careful. So they're just driving slow so they don't ruin the pie. So that's try, what I try to, I, I really just try to per, approach other people from a very open-minded perspective. Um, and of course... And I, uh, I think sometimes the key is understanding exactly. that you may not know exactly why they're doing what they're doing, but there's, a, there's a, probably a very good reason for it. Exactly, exactly. And, and like we see a lot of times on your channel, it's, you know, we, we never truly know what someone's going through. I mean, a lot of people can put on a, a, a smile and a pretty face um, and, you know, you really never know what happened to that person this morning or last night. Or, I mean, so just, just trying to be a little bit more empathetic. I think, of course, you know, coming from Alabama, we get, I'm, I won't say I'm apolitical. Um, I, I majored in political science in college, used to love politics, but um, I'm, way too empathetic to be a politician now because I want to help everybody. I want to be friends with everybody and um, I want everybody to like me. And of course, being a politician, that's not really uh, the way that works. Um, and of course, being in Alabama, we get a little bit more of one side than the other, which is what it is. And of course, I try to approach that with an open mind um, as well. But um, yeah, I think really empathy is, is probably the most important thing. Um, you know, just trying to, instead of jumping straight to a, well, I, I want to get you on that or I want to catch you on that, it's more of a, all right, well, why don't we just have a civilized conversation, see, you know, you got differences, I got differences. Let's see if we can find some commonalities and kind of meet in the middle, so. Excellent. All right. Christian, thank you so much for thank sharing you your story. I'm glad you're doing well. Thank you.